I'd like to introduce Bob Locken. Like I said, Bob is the smartest cat I know. Um, he brought White Cloud Analytics. Our relationship with White Cloud goes back multiple years. We would not be where we are without the ability to have this very tight partnership. So welcome, Bob. Thanks, Thanks. Jeff. <clears throat> Um, thanks for the invitation to speak, and uh, thanks for the kind words, uh, Jeff. You, you said earlier that if people f think the future's not different than today, they need to get out more. If you think I'm the smartest guy, you need to get out more. Um, spend some more time with Allison. No, I'll, I'll, uh, let me go through a couple things. The conventional wisdom for public speaking is you're supposed to start with a bunch of jokes. I'm an analytics guy. Have you ever seen an analytics guy's jokes? We'll skip those. I'll get straight to it. Really, what I'm going to do is just walk you through some high-level things, three core concepts. Why is analytics so important to population health? That's where I'm going to start. The why is really important. And then I'm going to talk about what specifically are analytics. It's not a spreadsheet. It's not a report. It's not an analyst. It's something different, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And then last, I'll finish up with how do we actually use that, and what's the challenges that we face in healthcare with using data to drive this transformation to value. But more importantly, then I'm gonna get off the stage and let Dr. Swanson, Dr. Fortuna, and Allison Powell actually show you what it looks like. And hopefully it looks very, very simple because if we didn't make it very, very simple, we didn't do our job. Um, but let's go through this. Before I get started on those three points, I probably should start with a little background on White Cloud. Um, White Cloud is actually from Boise, Idaho which might have several people ask question, what's a software company doing in Boise, Idaho? Um, our origins are with ProClarity, which was another software company that myself and a couple other people started, uh, I don't know, a decade or so ago in a little house on the north side of Boise. Um, we built analytic software back then, and we became, although we started in a little house, cooking our own top ramen as we wrote code in the basement, um, we grew to be the number one analytics tool on top of the number one analytics platform, which is the Microsoft platform. Um, and after a couple years of doing that reasonably well, um, we had a couple fairly important patents. Um, we had some fairly important results. And Microsoft acquired the company. It became Microsoft Boise in 2006. So the team at White Cloud is basically some, some team that I put together at ProClarity that then Microsoft bought, and then I stole them back. So that's how we got to where we're at. Um, <clears throat> I've been asked a couple times, why did Microsoft buy a software company in Boise, Idaho? Potato chips, I understand. Silicon chips, I understand. But software, analytics software in Boise, Idaho, why, why is that? And I think you know, the question is really good. Well, was it the people that Microsoft bought, or was it the patents that Microsoft bought? And, and I think the answer probably comes into both, but not exactly either. What they bought, the reason Microsoft bought White, excuse me, ProClarity back then um, was the outcomes. Because there was about 70 vendors who did analytic software on top of the Microsoft platform. We had an amazing string of our customers doing some incredible things with their data. I mean, things that showed up in very, very big numbers. Um, and so we had a string of some very big outcomes that we'd done with the data where <clears throat> other vendors' tools were slinging a lot of reports around and certainly delivering a lot of data to people. But it didn't appear that the organizations that were using those tools were actually affecting the outcomes. Um, and one specific example I would refer to is in healthcare, uh, happened to be one of our biggest customers was the Veterans Affairs, which is about 175 plus hospitals, a couple thousand clinics. Um, they put in their version of Epic in 1975. And from 1975 to, to 2000, they had a complete electronic medical record on a scale that had never been done before. That many hospitals, complete electronic medical record. But at the time, in 2000, their HEDIS metrics, the quality the system was, was producing, was the worst health delivery system in the US. And what they had done is they had spent from 1975 to 2000, doing an incredible good jo incredibly good, great job of collecting data, but they weren't doing much with it. Not the sort of things that would change the overall system outcomes. And they are responsible for a population of patients. So after eight years of our relationship with them, uh, they did an internal audit, 
And they came back and said, hey, we've done fabulous things. In the last eight years, we've taken our quality from worst to first for a government provider. Across the uh, scale and the scope of that biggest system, that's fairly impressive. More importantly, they said, we've done an incredible job of attacking waste. And they said they reduced, actually that's a typo, that five to 14 billion dollars of waste eliminated out of the system over that eight years. Now the reason that number ranges so widely is a lot of things you do with analytic shift behaviors and you, you're attacking like a pharmaceutical problem from multiple angles, it's kind of hard to attribute, it was it this program or that program. So it was a wide range, but they were fairly happy with that. Uh, that was testified in front of Congress, it's been well documented and talked about. And it was successes like that that caused Microsoft to buy ProClarity. Um, so let's move on beyond the company. Let's talk about why analytics is so important in population health. I think we all know that today's system, we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Today we have a reactive healthcare system, so much so that we've come up with cute little labels. Rescue medicine, we lead the world in rescue medicine. We let people get really, really bad, we sound the alarm, we run in, we rescue, and nobody does rescue medicine better than we do, right? We talk about sick care instead of health care. We are so good at rescue medicine, a reactive delivery system, to where the system basically sits there, and as soon as the patient initiates the need for care, then the system engages, and it engages at a world-class level. And we've talked about the problems with that. What we need to do is transform the system from being reactive to being proactive. Well, that's easy to say, but what does that actually take? Half a million patients in the St. Luke's service area, probably. So you want to get proactive, which doctor, which person is going to go get proactive with who to do specifically what? I mean, the point isn't to just get reactive to waste money, it's to reactive to make people's lives better. And that is what analytics can provide for people. The second thing that really analytics can solve on this, this journey of trying to move into a population health system is that Today's system is silos. And I actually think silos is a term we use a lot. I think it's a generous term. I think we're maybe silos in the hospital, but I think across the delivery system, we're not silos, we're islands. We have a very complex system with very little interconnectivity between the pieces and parts. Probably the number one thing that causes waste is not the people doing their job within the four walls of their office or their service vehicle, but it's the seams between them. There's two parts that silos ca ca cause problems. One is we talk about you know, the longitudinal aspects of a patient and what do they need across their entire life, the continuum of care across their life. That's one silo. But you remember yesterday we talked a lot about irrational variation? Irrational variation is when you have 50 people doing things, one thing, 50 different ways. That is not those people's fault, it's the system's issue. We are independent systems. That sort of variation comes when people operate in silos. We need to transform that system to make it an aligned system. And that's what data can do. That's what analytics can do. So that's the two parts, that's why this is so critical. You can't really attack population health without really good analytics. Let's talk about what actually analytics are. The easiest way to understand analytics is patterns. What we do is, we run software on data and extract patterns out of the data. And you probably go, that's really interesting, why do I care? Why would I care about the patterns that exist in the data? Well, there's a couple things that are important about those patterns. Number one is, we use those patterns to understand what's actually going on. Because think about it, if the only way you can learn is through your eyes, through what you can physically observe, then I guess we're gonna continue to operate in our own little island. Right, because I'll be able to see the patient come in and the patient leave, and then when they're gone, I have no clue what's happening to them after that, right? So the very first thing we do with patterns is start to look at what's actually happening. It, this is how we find where there's irrational variation, is we look at patterns and data, and we say, okay, given the risks of this patient and what you're doing, it seems that there's a lot of variation in how we're doing this particular procedure. Does that make any sense? I don't know, I'm a data guy, I can surface the data, but I found if you give that data to really smart physicians, they can figure out quickly whether that's rational or irrational variation. So that's the first thing we do with data. The second thing we do with data is we predict. 
right? If we're going to move to proactively caring for the community, we have to start to be able to predict where it is we're going to have crisis interventions that are very expensive and not a very good use of money, and how do we get ahead of those? So that's the second thing you can do with patterns, right? If anybody's ever shopped on Amazon, you've used analytics because we use the patterns of what you search for and what you click for to make sure that we put the next thing that you would like to buy right in front of you. That way, when you check out, you bought more than you came for. We'd like to use analytics to change, transform the healthcare system to make it more population-centric. The last thing's the most important thing. It does no good to understand what's going on. And it does no good to be able to predict what's going on if you can't design a system that can intervene. Right? We have to redesign the system to be aligned to be proactive. It it's, can't just be about shoveling more no, dumb numbers at people. And we have so much data, we can bury people. And so that's not really the point we're trying to get to. So that's what we do with analytics is effectively taking the patterns out of the data and getting it in front of somebody that can make some sense of them so that they can redesign the delivery system and move it into a population health delivery system. Now, there's a, a particular challenge that most of you probably aren't aware of because you don't do this for a living. In healthcare, when we talk about how we're gonna actually use analytics to transform the delivery system, there's some challenges that come uniquely in healthcare. And it comes from this. Um, we all know that healthcare is a complex system. Everybody agree with that? How about a population health delivery system? Is that complex? Is that complex enough for you? <laughs> I mean, if you sat through the last couple days, we should know there's a massive amount of complexity here. The question is, is what sort of system are we dealing with? Because how you intervene and change the behavior of the system depends on the type of system. The first type of complex systems we know from theory is unminded systems. We won't talk about that. We hope that we've got at least one person thinking in the building. So these are, an unminded system would be like a copier or an MRI machine. The second type of system is where we start to get interesting. It's a mechanical, it's called a mechanical system we most know it as a tops-down command and control sort of system, right? One mind at the top, lots of moving pieces down below. Taking, so think about that model. It implies wisdom at the top, change is directives down. That's how most companies work. That's how our family unit works, right? Parents are supposed to, well, actually, today it would be the kids telling the parents, but that, we've kind of inverted the triangle there, but you get the point. It is one decision maker, moving decisions, increasingly granularity down, and this is control through directive. There's a third type of system called a biological system, and the way to think about that is it's the most complex of the complex because there's lots of different moving parts, and they all have their own mind. They all get to make their own decisions, and how do you actually control and shape that system? The reason that's important is we produce analytics to change outcomes, which means we have to actually influence decisions. But who's making the decision in that model? They're all over the place. So it stops being about, hey, I need a good statistics tool and a good analyst to get the C-level officers what they need. And it starts to be the question of how do you use patterns in a massively complex set of data to influence thousands of different decision makers, all who have a different set of responsibilities, scope of expertise, different types of decisions they're making. And that is fundamentally the problem. Traditional tools to work with data are built for st statisticians and analysts, and that assumes you have access to one. But I would contend that most physicians have no access to an analyst, so we just throw reports at them, and the problem with reports is they only work when the decision is extremely simple. So the complexity of the decisions we're dealing with, reports don't work. This is not news. We've been pu pushing reports at people for 30 years, and they most of the time get ignored, and there's a reason. So in biological systems, how the decisions are made. They're made across the system. And if they're simple decisions, we can facilitate that with re simple reports. But if they're complex decisions, we need to allow those people to synthesize the data. We need to allow them to analyze the data, to look at the patterns in the data so that they can make a good decision. That's hard when there's thousands of them. How do we move from reactive to proactive? That's not a David Pate decision. That's get the entire system to be more proactive. Think about the level of decisions we're talking about, thinking about where they're made. You'll see some of the complexity we're talking about. And then lastly, if we're gonna remove the waste out of the system, we gotta get rid of the silos, we gotta get alignments to best practices, evidence-based medicine, 
we got to get some sort of control over our processes so that we can get them more lean, more consistent, and more reliable. 